Have your Bibles turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. looking at verse 8 through verse 15. Verse 8 through verse 15. Of course, last week we looked at Paul writing in verses 6 and 7 where he said that we're to be rooted and built up in Christ and established in the faith and abounding therein with thanksgiving and as they were taught. And we looked at that in connection with how we are taught in the Word of God. And Paul continuing says, uh, verse 8, Beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tra- tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him, or in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, or to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing uh, over them in it. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening, Lord, that you have triumphed. Father, I thank you for the fullness, the fullness of Christ. I thank you, Father, uh, that Christ is fully divine. Yes. Lord, we know of your humanity and your sacrifice in your humanity. But Lord, there was also sacrifice in the divinity. And we thank you for the fullness. Father, I pray that you would help us as Christians to live in the fullness of Christ. And Lord, realizing that uh, we are uh, your product. Father, we, through the Lord Jesus Christ, are made new. And Lord, I pray that as we look into your word this evening that we would be reminded of what we have in Christ and not be tempted to turn back to the elementary things of this world. And Father, we'll give you glory, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us to beware to beware of uh, philosophy, beware of being spoiled through philosophy and through vain deceit and traditions of men, and we ought not be we ought to be careful and not think that he's talking about education. Mm-hmm. You know that well, Paul said, don't be educated and don't think about education and just throw off education. He said, uh, don't be spoiled through philosophy. Well, Paul can't be saying that because he'd be a hypocrite. He is one of the most educated men uh, of that time. And so, what's he talking about? And really here, we begin to see Paul, as they say today, uh, begin to unpack the problem of what was going on at the church uh, of Colossae. And he, he mentions philosophy and vain deceits and traditions of men. And then he speaks of the rudiments of the world. And that is sort of a a difficult thing to translate because uh, that word is used several times in the New Testament and and it's used in different ways. It's one of those words that, you know, if I were going to say it, I would say it this way. And Carrie, if you were going to say it, you might use a little bit different word. And it all means the same thing. 
uh, or uh, it all can mean the same thing here, though uh, it's used a little bit differently than in other places. In Second Peter, it's used as elements, as what we see the earth. The elements are going to burn with a fervent or melt with a fervent heat, and so there the word is used to talk about the earth, the the water, the wind, the, the elements, and and it's all going to melt and burn up. And then in Galatians, it's used almost in a similar way here in Galatians chapter 4 when it talks about going back to the beggarly elements of the traditions of men. And now we start to see a little bit of what Paul's talking about here. And he also uses it in another negative sense, uh, but in a negative sense uh, in spiritual things. And he talks about in, uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about in uh, Hebrews 5.12, about the first principles of the oracles of God, that we as, as Christians ought to move beyond that and grow and mature. And the word principles there is what we see here translated rudiments. And, and I think that that's what he's getting at. I think he's talking about uh, the, the principles of the world. And there may be a spiritual element to that because Paul, remember, is dealing with the fact that there's a, a sense that we want to over-spiritualize the church in Colossae. We want to uh, worship angels and we want to uh, look at things that are over-spiritual and we're forgetting about the Lord Jesus Christ and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and though we can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, I think that part of the problem here in Colossae was a Gnostic problem. There seems to be a, a problem with a, that Gnosticism of, of we, want to, we want spiritual, but we don't want physical. And we want to live on a spiritual plane and, and forget that we live in a physical world. And the Gnostics taught that uh, the, the, the physical is, is dirty and the physical is, is awful and we, we don't want to deal with the physical. And so really we want to look at God in, in His spiritual realm and in doing that, we can't assign divinity to Christ because Christ was a man. Mm -hmm. And there can be no mixing of the spiritual and the physical. And so you can see that coming into the church and the problem that would cause, because as Paul is going to tell us in just a moment, that's the whole point. Yeah. And without the mixing of the two, there's no atonement. And so Paul is telling the church in Colossae, look, Beware. Now, when you see a sign that says beware, usually it's what? Beware the dog. <laughs> What's it telling you? There's danger. That's right. And so Paul's saying to the church, beware. Beware of those coming into the church and making light of the sacrifices of Christ, and making light of what Christ had to endure for you and for me, making light of the divinity of Christ and, and excusing or eliminating the divinity of Christ for without the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ who was fully human, without His divinity, there's no atonement. Right. Without the atonement, we're what? We're still dead in our trespasses in sin. There's no forgiveness of sin. And Paul's telling the church at Colossae and he's telling our church tonight and telling churches uh, throughout the world, beware, be watchful, be mindful that you don't get caught up in over-spiritualizing things and forget about who Christ is. Forget about the divinity of Christ. Forget about the spiritual nature of the man, Christ Jesus. And we see that today. We see that today a lot in charismatic circles. We see it today in where uh, they, they say, well, um, you know, we want that next new thing. The charismatics today, and this is not meant to be a sermon against charismatics, don't misunderstand, but that charismatic teaching is one of, we want that new thing. They're almost like the Mars Hill group of today. We want that next new thing. We want that new prophecy. We want that new teaching. We want something extra biblical right. and you'll hear them talk about God speaking to me and telling me this or telling me that and when you say well how can we line that up with God's word we can't mm -hmm. but God said that to me 
And you can't take that away from me. Well, John deals with the problem of Gnosticism very specifically, and we know that was the problem he was dealing with in 1 John. And he tells us in chapter 4, try the Spirit, test the Spirit. And how did he say to do that? He said that, and you could say, Sister Vicki, ask the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That Spirit speaks to you and tells you something. You ask that Spirit, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And if that Spirit confesses or agrees that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that Spirit is of God. Mm -hmm. That's an angel, or that's God Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. But if that Spirit does not agree that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then that is a satanic spirit who has come to trip you up. Right. And, and, and that seems like, Brother Tommy, an easy test. Yeah. Somebody's telling me to do something I don't know. Should I do that? Should I not do that? Is that biblical? Is it not biblical? Let me ask. You believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh? If you don't get affirmation back, okay, either my spirit is trying to trip me up or an evil spirit is trying to trip me up, but whoever's talking to me isn't from God because I would have got affirmation that Jesus Christ is a fleshly being, a person, a human, but He's also divine. Amen. And that's what Paul is ultimately trying to say Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Don't let the philosophies of men, don't let the traditions of men, don't let the elemental or elementary spirits or teachings of men tell you otherwise. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. Why? Because He is divine. Amen. He has God in Him. Well, how do we know that? Well, what does Paul say in the very next word in verse 9? For, because in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Dwelleth. That's a present continuous tense. You see, some teach that Christ had a a divine spirit on him when he was in this world. That God sort of in his spirit overshadowed this man Christ. But when Christ went away, that spirit was taken away. That he himself wasn't really God. But Paul tells us that Christ, what? The fullness forever dwelleth. Present continuous tense. Today, the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ, just like it was 2,000 years ago, just like it was before the incarnation. It doesn't say, for in Him at his incarnation dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It says, in him, now, presently, well, where was Christ presently at this point? At the right hand of the Father. Amen. Ever living to make intercession for you and I. How is that going to happen? How is that going to happen for you and I today? In the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so all the fullness of the Godhead not talking about just God the Father, we're talking about God, mm -hmm. the Trinity. Right. It's the only place this word is used in the New Testament. Not just talking about God as God the Father. No, all the fullness of the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell in Christ. Mm -hmm. What Paul getting at here? Look at verse 10. And you are complete. Now, I think a, a better way 
to translate that, and we see this from chapter 1, verse 9, where Paul says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might what? Be filled with the knowledge. The word ye might, or the phrase ye might be filled, is the same word complete here. And it's a very similar word to the word fullness in, chap- in verse 9 in chapter 2. For in him dwelleth all the fullness, in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye, the church, are filled or brought to fullness, how? In Christ, which is the head of all principality and authority or power. So beware of the philosophy of the world, the tradition of the world, the rudiments or principles of the world that would teach you that Christ is not completely divine. Because in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. And you, the church, are filled in Him. So that means, Brother Phil, when I was saved, when you were saved, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily indwelled me in the Holy Spirit. Now that does not mean we're God. Amen. That does not mean we're little God. Amen. That does not mean we're divine in any way whatsoever. Amen. But what it means is that I don't have to rush after the traditions and teachings of the world that tell me who Christ is and what Christ was and what He really meant to do when I have all that placed in me at salvation. I am complete. I am full. Now if I'm already full, Krishan, how are you going to fill me with something else? The only way to fill me with something else is take a glass, fill it up with water, and if you want milk, what do you got to do? You got to pour out the water. So the only way for me to accept the fullness of the world through the traditions of men and the philosophies of men and the new thing that, that people in the church want to accept I have to empty out Christ. Mm. But if I receive the fullness of Christ, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I can't be filled with anything else. Mm. How does that take place? How do we receive the fullness of Christ? How do we receive the fullness of God? Paul tells us in verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Well, how did he die? Why did he die? We're going to skip over those verses to answer that question first. In verse 13, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, Christ, quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How? blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now that's also an interesting turn of phrase. Right. Because it can mean a couple things. It could simply mean the law. And, And we are guilty under the law. And the ordinances of the law. But he goes on saying, nailing it to the cross. Well, what does that mean? 
And just like the charges of Christ were nailed to His cross. Right. I think what Paul is trying to tell us is the ordinance of the law that we are guilty. Christ took that and He nailed it to His cross. Our guilt our lawlessness. And He nailed that to His cross just like nailed to His cross here is King of the Jews. Right. That was a sentence, by the way. Mm -hmm. Because there was only one king. And that was Caesar. And Paul is telling us that Christ took our guilt, took our crime, took the writing of that sentence and nailed it to his cross. Now, how do we receive that? How do we receive that forgiveness? How do we receive that blotting out of all of our trespasses? Through the faith of the operation of God. Through the faith of the workings of God who hath raised him who died for our sins from the dead. Now you start to get what Paul's really trying to say. Christ died for you. Right. Christ took your guilt. Yes. Christ took your crimes and nailed them to the cross. And in doing that, He wiped away all your sins. He wiped away and blotted out all your guilt. There's no more crime. It's like when the President of the United States, whoever that President may be, and they typically do it at the end of their term because that way there's you know, no more consequences. Uh, Reagan did it. Clinton did it. Both Bushes did it. Obama may do it. They all do it. At the end of their term... They start pardoning people. Yeah. And, and look, I'm not getting into the politics of it. I'm just saying that's what happens. Now, there was one individual that President Clinton was going to pardon many, many years ago now. Seems like yesterday. And the individual refused the pardon. And you say... Why would you refuse a pardon? That means you can go free. And he was on the lam. He was in Europe somewhere and knew he couldn't come back to America because he'd get arrested. But he wouldn't accept the pardon. And somebody caught up with him. You know, reporters can catch up with people that even the police and the government can't. You want to catch ISIS? Call anonymous. Don't call the military. They know where they're at anyway. I told you I wasn't going to get political, and I did. <laughs> well, what happened? Why? Because he said, as soon as I accept that pardon, I'm admitting guilt. Mm. And I'm not guilty. Mm. That's what he said. Whether he was or not, who knows? But he said, in order to accept the pardon, I have to accept the guilt. And I'd rather live on the lamb, running from the law, and maintain my innocence than accept guilt. And, and that's where we're at right here. That's right. Paul is saying when you go back, Colossian Church, when you go back to the philosophy of the world, the traditions of men, when you go back to the elementary principles of the world, what you're saying is you're not guilty. You've done nothing wrong. Therefore, you don't need anyone to die for you. You don't need anyone to take your guilt and take your crime because you've committed none. In order to get saved, you have to admit your guilt. In order to receive the pardon of Christ, you have to own the fact you're guilty, you've done it, you deserve to die. And Paul said the danger is that you're going to give up that life you have in Christ for these elementary 
And you can almost hear the disdain in his voice. These elementary ABCs. It's almost like he's saying, you're going to give up your ability to read whole sentences and whole paragraphs so you can go back to singing your ABCs. Now who would do that? And Paul said, that's what you're doing. Beware. Be careful. You say, Brother Rick, how do I know? How do I know? I'm going through my day. I'm living my life. And I'm wondering... Am I living in the fullness of Christ? Mm. Or am I starting to go back to the elementary principles of the world? Philosophy and traditions of men. Rick, how do I know? One way or the other. And verse 11 tells us, In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And that's how you know. What's your sin life like? We ask people what your prayer life is like. We ask mm-hmm. what your, your Bible study is like. We ask what your church life is like. What's your sin life like? Yeah. And Paul said, Colossian Church, you can know that you've been saved. You can know that the fullness of Christ is in you daily, moment by moment. You can know that you're not giving in to false teachings, to false vain deceits of this world. How can I know what your sin life like? Have you put off sin? Or are you still dabbling with it? The little white lies which there's no such thing. Right. Nothing little about it, nothing white about it. It's big and it's dark. And Christ died for it. So there's nothing little about it. What about false gods? You say, well, Rick, I don't have any statues in my house. So I'm good. Mm, not so much. What about work? What about money? What about friends? What about anything that I put before the Lord Jesus Christ? And Paul said, Christ died for all of that. You were dead in your sins, in your trespasses, and Christ came along without invitation and took your guilt and your crimes and nailed it to the cross. And you can have that life that He has given to you through Christ by faith. How? By faith. How do I know what your sin life like? And if you and I can daily, without even so much as blinking or blushing, commit even the smallest of sins, we may want to go back and beware. What are we trusting in? What are we hoping upon? Who do we think died for us? See, I think for some, the forgiveness of Christ is so easy for us that we have forgotten what it cost Christ. He said taking that and nailing it to the cross taking that guilt and nailing it to the cross. Well, for Christ, His sentence was above Him. For us, it is Him. Mm -hmm. He became guilty. 
He became a criminal for you and I. That's right. He nailed himself to the cross. What's your sin life like? Verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he, Christ, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You know what that means? That means he won. That's right. That means he's victorious over principalities and powers. That's everything. Yeah. That's visible and invisible. He's victorious. You want the victory over sin? Christ. Mm. Not some mystical, magical something. But Christ in us, empowering us by His Spirit through the fullness of the Godhead to obey the Scriptures. Not by Him magically, mystically saying, poof, no more problem with sin. Now you can live the rest of your life, no worries. I don't know about you. But like Emerald Lagasse used to say, you know, I don't know about you, but we're, I, my water don't come salted. <laughs> I don't know about you, but um, my life didn't come without sin. And I don't know about you, but after I came to Christ, I still have to deal with sin. Yeah. Every day. Every moment of every day. And Paul said, if you want, you can listen to the world and their magical proof of how you're going to get out of sin and not have to worry about it ever again. Or you can allow Christ by faith to come into you and provide you that seal of that covenant relationship. And in the Old Testament, that was what? That was physical circumcision. In the New Testament, it is, how's your sin life? The seal that you and I are in a covenant relationship is the putting off of sin. Every day. Every moment of every day. How? This book, <laughs> the meditation upon this book, and the power of Christ in us who fully dwells <laughs> presently Permanently, continuously, the Godhead dwells in Him. In us, we are filled and made complete <clears throat> to do what God's Word said to do. What's your sin life like? Heavenly Father, I thank You for the fullness of Christ. I thank you for the promise of Christ in our lives, for filling and completing us. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to examine our sin life. And Lord, ask ourselves, what's our sin life like? And Father, that will give us the answer to everything we need to know about our relationship with the man, the God-man, called Jesus. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.